when I woke up from the surgery after they removed the cyst right and he said um, so when you know maybe you can't conceived naturally my tubes were severely blocked and that was a root shock la, at 26 like I didn't know what to feel or expect but I knew my husband and I always wanted children before we begin maybe yeah. you just kind of like introduce yourself you know for our audience that don't know you what do you do how do you how you know how why are we here you know kind of okay. kind of something along okay. those lines yeah super mom go first <laughs> No, I'm just a normal mom. Hi, I'm Suen, uh, and I'm a mother of two kids, and I went through IVF for both of them. Hi, I'm Dr. Suresh Naya. I've been doing IVF for 32 years now. 32 and years? Yes. And Where I, were you practicing? Originally in KK Hospital, uh, way back, but before that, I did my training in uh, Australia, and then in the United Kingdom, and different parts, you know, and the United States as well. So I think at that time in the early years, uh, IVF and also some, the other area that I'm really interested in is laparoscopic surgery, where keyhole surgery as is known. That area was moving in different uh, direction in different countries. So I went to different countries to really uh, hone in on my skills and then got into getting mummies and daddies uh, to, be, to, be have, to have children. And so this is where I am today. Nice, wow. nice. Yeah, I think we will have a lot of technical terms to clarify yes. today. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What is keyhole surgery? <laughs> what is IVF? What is IUI? You know, apparently, like there's so yes. so many things to, to clarify. Mm -hmm. But yeah, before we begin, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Jaslyn, uh, founder of the Busy Woman Project. Mm. So Good. it is a community for busy women uh, to really find their purpose and balance through mental, physical and financial Fantastic. health. Nice. Fantastic. Is it a struggle for women? You know, that is trying to be busy and succeed in the corporate world to also kind of give some entertainment to this like mummyhood type of thing. You know what I mean? Like you want to do this, you just want to do that, you just want to do that. Everything you just want to do. As the super mom, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So like trying to be so many things for yeah. everyone yeah. and taking it's on crazy. so many positions. Mm. Yeah, mm. I think. I think because everybody have very high expectation of a woman, right? Like you have to be good mother but you also have to hold a career and you also have to do well in a career yeah too many hats to to wear yeah you still gotta be a good mom and yeah. then there's, there's everything so so is it is it even possible is it even possible to do all of that you know just from your own personal experience and no, maybe your community's experience yeah where I am now, I would want to put in more effort in my with my kids. Mm. But of course, on the other hand, I would also want to be want to have my career. Also, mm. Mm. so yes, it's actually very tough to manage both time. But mm. I think as you go along, you know, sometimes because all these big changes when you become a mother, right? All these big changes can uh, be very overwhelming. But you have you just have to go along and see how it, where it brings you. Based on that line of how you describe it, it sounds like you have given career a little bit of a backseat. I did put a backseat in my career because I actually went through multiple rounds of IVF to have my children. So at that moment, I was still young. But to me, time you cannot you cannot get back time. You know, mm. like. Although I still feel like I'm 20 plus, but I'm already 30s, in my 30s already. It's okay, you can forever 21 one. I think that's the thing. I, I really feel like I'm forever in my 20s, correct? <laughs> but my biological clock is running, Absolutely. you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's running. I, I can't say that, oh, um, yeah, I feel this way, but you know, my body is not dead, you know? To me, it's, it's either now, if not, I think um, years down the road, I don't think I'll be able to have kids because I personally know that I have issues also. And what was the decision parameters around it? Given there is there are so many mm. things that are important to you in life, mm -hmm. right? So there are, there's your career, there's your family. How did you come to a decision that, yes, I'm going to take a back seat? I think it's that. also because when I just got married, right, I actually knew that I have problems. I will have problems conceiving on my own. And during that time, just a little story, I was only 26, got married. And when I went for a full body checkup, I found a cyst, ovarian cyst. So during the surgery, I actually didn't know this, but the doc my previous gynae, my doctor said that my tubes were severely blocked. When I woke up from the surgery, after they removed the cyst, right? And he said, um, so when, you know, maybe you can't, conceive naturally and that was a root shock la, at 26 like oh. I didn't know what to feel or expect but I knew my husband and I always wanted children mm. and I always wanted children my, on my own so because of that kind of no choice right 
So once we got married, I went to see a fertility specialist and that is Dr. Nayo. Mm. <laughs> the usual expectation is when you get married, people expect you to have children and mm. that's the natural cause of events. Mm. You might start off with the two dogs, but eventually you'll think, I need children as well. And, and that's the usual expectation, you know. Mm. But then you wait one year, nothing seems to happen. Then wait another year, then you think to yourself, maybe, okay, leave it to nature, it will happen eventually. And then you delve yourself into career, but right down in your heart, it 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 aches, you know. You you think your friends having children, and then sooner or later you find you um you don't want to be with your friends because they're always talking about kid stuff. Yeah, true. And there you are as a couple, no kids yet. Yeah, I got my two dogs, but I got no kids. Then they talk about. I went to this nursery, I got this uh, sort of uh, special sale there was, you know, where I got some, even even simple things like buying a nice dress for your child and all that. And sooner or later, you then get yourself out of that circle of friends mm. you've had, and then you feel quite alone. And this is where you need support from friends, family, and your SG fertility, where you can have a source of information, you know, because sometimes it takes a lot of energy, courage to even come to see a doctor and, and see whether do I have a problem or not. And your spouse. Many men have the mistaken notion that it is a female problem. Mm. Mm. And believe you me, 50% of the time, it's a sperm problem, mm. a, a male problem. Mm. Ah, you see and guys, think, your problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Please you, don't always think uh, the women. Uh, tell the yeah. mother-in-law, don't keep scolding the part. <laughs> Absolutely. Real. That's real. <laughs> And the yeah, poor yeah. girl, in many cultures, everywhere you go, they think it's a female problem. Mm. Mm. And only in recent times, we are getting a little bit more information, we're getting more educated. Mm. And Sue Ann and a group of friends have done a tremendous job of starting off this SG fertility. So SG. Sue Ann, yeah. I'm curious uh, about, with your community, do you involve both the females and their partners, mm -hmm. like the males, uh -huh, or uh -huh. is it just the females? Like how, like how do you run that? Okay, so uh, we actually started a group to talk about fertility issues. Fertility support sg is our Instagram. Mostly actually women, but we did start a group for men. Mm. It's just that sometimes the men are a bit quiet, but there is a group for them, and they do. They still can ask questions. Some of the men now they are actually very supportive. Surprisingly, I mean, mm. I, I feel a bit surprised lah. Mm. But it's um, a good sign, right? Yeah, that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because some of sometimes women they do not want to approach us, um, for advice. So so we do have husbands coming to us saying like, oh my my wife is going through this retrieval now. What what can she do to up her chance of success? And it's the men who actually ask us. Mm. What are some other ways you find that males are? Um, supporting their partners? What are some key ways of supporting the person going through the IVF process? To me, I think when you're going through IVF or even IUI, right, there's a lot of medications that you are going to take and a lot of injections, hormone injections. And I think uh, it will cause a lot of mood swings, does it? It does. All yeah, the husbands right. say so. <laughs> 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 There's been a sudden surge of earplug yeah, sales. Yeah, earplug sales. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, it does. It, but we mustn't, uh, I mean, make too big a yeah, deal yeah. out of it. Yeah. But it, I think, it, yeah, yeah it, it causes like mood swings. And also you, it causes bloatedness also. It does, right? Yeah. I felt very bloated when I was going through IVF. And very tired as well. The estrogens, which is a hormone mm. that increases, makes you very sleepy and tired oh, as well. Yeah, okay. so yeah, but these are some things that we don't really know until you go through it. Then it's like, eh, mm, then you feel so bloated. And all this actually, it will get it to you, isn't it? Like, I'm not pregnant, but now you say that. Mm. I look pregnant. And you'll feel yeah. so... Sound, yeah, sounds like there's yeah. a lot of emotional like turmoil yes. in terms of your yeah. body image, mm. but also like Correct. the mental side Correct. of things, right? Yeah, yeah. Correct. And the stress of going through the anguish when things don't work out or you, you realize that sometimes you have no way of predicting from both men and women whether mm. sperm quality is good, the egg quality is mm. good. You go all of this and then it doesn't really pan out. So as doctors, we try to explain, put forth certain solutions and uh, all is not lost. We have other ways in which we can manage and get, get to where you want to get. And I think uh, a lot of times 
you're talking about daddies or daddies to be father, uh, husbands mm -hmm. uh, supporting uh, and even in same sex couples the fact that he even comes to the visits oh. mm. it's a yes. tremendous thing Mm. And sometimes they, mm. he is apprehensive and he stays out of the picture, uh, mainly mm. because he, he, he feels he doesn't want to have his problems uh, compound what his wife is going through. Sometimes the wife wants to get to the appointment, do her own stuff and then come back home. Mm. Or participating in injections, getting to jot down what time she has to have it done and so on and so mm. forth. Different levels of participation. But there are those who just either by due to fear mm. or apathy uh, or not realizing that you know they have a major role to play mm. might just stay uh, away so typically snapping happens when a need is not met right so from mm. a woman's perspective i'm curious like what is that you actually require from your partner i think it's just being understanding or even um other family members maybe like parents siblings i think just being understanding that this whole journey is not easy um, there's a lot of anxiety that the woman is going through so just be more understanding sometimes when the woman snap it's not like they want to sometimes it's just that they are so overwhelmed with everything really they don't know what to expect you know when you go for the visit oh maybe the scans didn't go well so all this will actually affect their emotions personally i feel don't blame because when we are going through ivf treatments uh, sometimes when after women go like retrieve the eggs ready right then they then let's say if up to day three or day five there's like lesser embryos found sometimes the men will say oh because you didn't eat well who asked you mm. who asked you uh, never sleep properly uh, I told you not to not I told you not to go back to work already yeah, they will say this kind of thing. They will start blaming the woman because you are the one who is doing the injections. Mm. Say, then why you didn't, why, or why you still, maybe some of them still smoke or drink. So why do you still drink? Why do you still smoke? You see, lesser embryos is your fault. Well, from yeah. a doctor's perspective, right? Like if you have the best diet, if you're not smoking, so on and so forth. Like does that actually help with the number of eggs you're getting? Yeah, generally, I mean, at least when it comes to smoking, uh, it's one of the most detrimental things uh, that affects your reproductive organs um, primarily, uh, both eggs and sperms as well. And ironically, excessive exercise. Mm. Some of us who take a high protein mm. diet and excessively exercise, some of my couples are super fit, but uh, that is detrimental to sperm counts who will come down because of the heat buildup. Sometimes it affects the egg counts as well, surprisingly. Yeah, so, interesting. Yeah, so that's that's a, a major issue which we address. Obesity, of course, yes. Again, with uh, with regard to excess estrogen hormones in women, women with polycystic ovaries, there's a condition called polycystic ovaries where, ironically, got loads of eggs, but they are poorer quality. Mm. And they don't really come up, mm. you see. But I'm curious, say like, you know, some of the blames that were being said, right? Like yeah. you know, working too yeah. much, so and so that's forth. Right. Like, yeah. are they all valid or um, is there some that's not no, valid? No, sometimes you see, it's really difficult for a girl to go through all of this mm -hmm. and stay at home, not do anything. <laughs> you go crazy. Uh, at least I would, you know. Yeah. But uh, so <laughs> I encourage him, get on with your work, but at least have a chat with your boss. Uh, all, all your people working with you, you know, I've got to go for certain appointments. I can't stay very late at night. I, I, I tell them, you know, mm. don't hold big meetings and make major decisions and all. In that few 10 days uh, where, you know, give your, yourself a bit of a break, do some work because you want to take your mind off things and then uh, have a bit of leeway mm. where you can come for your checkups and things like that and do your injections in the morning and go off to work, or maybe certain mornings work from home, yeah. and so on and so forth. Especially this whole concept of working from home, if there's anything positive that came out of the pandemic mm. was this concept of work from home, mm. you know? Yes. So uh, yeah. increasingly, I'm recommending that uh, mm. so that you're in a home environment, at least occupied, you know? Uh, and the worst time for a girl, or it, even a couple, is when you put back the embryo and you're waiting the longest two weeks of your life to oh. find out whether you've fallen pregnant yes. or not. That's the yes. worst thing that's ever, honestly. True. I mean, at least that's yeah. what uh, you, you can share this. Mm. Uh, so when after you put the embryo back, right, the th problem with IVF, right, is not a guarantee, you see. So when you put the embryo back, the embryo also need 
to implant itself. So all this, we have to probably leave it to God, correct? Or nature, so to speak. So during that two weeks, if you don't do anything, you will really go crazy. And then you know what you'll do? That's what I do. Uh, and I, I believe everybody who goes through it, do it. Lie down there. No, you lie down there. You start to... You start, must faster stick. No, you, you start to... Doctor Google. Oh, Google, oh Google. my god. Oh, yeah. I have a bit of cramps here. Is it successful? Oh, oh is it uh is it fail? Yeah, uh now that you yeah. start to go crazy. Or maybe some some of us will like start to buy uh pregnancy test kits and then start testing like morning mm. day night. Oh my there are so many that. dynamics at play yes. here, right? There's really the yeah. relationship, your emotional kind of well-being, uh, and there's also uh -huh. financial stuff and so all yeah. coming uh, together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you clearly and can tell that I don't really know what the hell's going on, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> all I know is the bloatedness. I thought it's like heatiness, yeah. but you know Chinese yeah. medicine, yeah. Right? everything yeah. is heaty, right? Yeah, yeah, but maybe you can kind of help people like me, right? Or like, you know, tangent okay. to, you know, mm. uh, certain couples, right? So it's kind of like in this realm of fertility healthcare. You know, like there's IVF, there's egg freezing, there's, there's all these different, different things, right, right? right? Maybe, you know, doctor could kind of give us this like big landscape, like what does yeah. it encompass? What are the different stages and things? It's, yeah. it's, it's a good question to ask. And it's a realization that uh, you you asked me a while ago, Jazz, why is it the, now there's more uh, IVF or more awareness? It's, it's just that there's more awareness. You know that we can do something about it. I hope we can say we are 100% successful, but we can do something about it. So what's uh, important to realize is IVF is just one segment. Sometimes couples just may not be trying at the right time. So it's not that uh, we introduce that straight away. Mm -hmm. We have timing, uh, you know, we do scans to see whether she's growing something called a follicle. It's a little mm -hmm. egg bag that's in the ovary. Some of us may not be growing that mm -hmm. and therefore all we need is a little tablet and when we uh, show that the tubes are open by a simple uh, test called uh, HSG for short and then we check the sperm counts just to make sure that she, she's not going through many cycles only find out that the husband the has sperm problem. count <laughs> yes you know and, and, and it has occurred uh, precious time is wasted anguish um, disappointment and so on and so forth so the preliminary assessment is all important. Mm. And so we in the fraternity, uh, we have our doctors well educated and uh, trained to make sure that the important tests are done so that we can draw the roadmap as it were, which direction to take. In some instances, it's not as if uh, there's been a mistaken notion that IVF must be used as a last resort. Mm. That's not the case. In fact, sometimes there are instances where the question is asked, why wasn't the couple given access to IVF from day mm -hmm. one? They deserve that. If the sperm counts are of a certain level, if the tubes are blocked or the tubes are damaged, then it is really an uh, absolute waste of precious time to put her through or put the couple through any uh, other treatment. And it's like, um, I liken this to those who are um, not uh, quite certain about uh, uh, why this is the strategy that we should use. For example, I have a tumor. My doctor won't say, let me try with the chemotherapy that's least effective first. Mm. And then we go on. No, we want to get to the appropriate treatments. And thankfully, we live in a country where it's accessible. We got three big, well-established government hospitals that provide IVF for every Singaporean, every uh, person that lives in uh, Singapore. And there's uh, a good amount of support, so much so that sometimes in your first three cycles that you do, you don't have much uh, in the way of uh, out-of-pocket uh, expenses. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 So that's, uh, that's tremendous. Mm -hmm. You just go around the region, sometimes this is not that forthcoming. Yeah. But these days, the WHO has uh, established way back 20 years ago that infertility is not a lifestyle choice it is a proper we use the word disease uh, that mm. requires treatment it is your right to have access to the treatment for fertility uh, so many governments around the world were taken to task so what's the difference from a treatment okay, standpoint so in iui it's an acronym for intra means inside the uterus insemination we 
uh, concentrate the sperms through a laboratory process, and then we grow the follicles, usually one or two, no more than that, because we don't want multiple pregnancies. And I'll come to the problem of multiple pregnancies in a short while. And we then give nature a little bit of a boost by growing a bit more uh, of, uh, follicles, which contain the eggs, because in, in natural cycles, that's just the one egg that the sperm can choose to fertilize. And then by increasing those numbers, we boost the female side. By concentrating the sperms, we boost the male side. And at the right time, uh, the processed sperms is uh, taken up in a small tube. And it's a sl very slender tube, don't need any anesthesia. It's done in the clinic uh, setting of the doctor. It's uh, slid into the uterus and released. And five minutes later, you, you can go home. So we, it is still very natural. So the fertilization, the sperm meeting the eggs still occurs the natural way. Mm. So the tubes must be open for that mm. because if you don't have uh, tubes that are, we use the word patent, uh, so that it's open and it meets the sperm, then you can't do that. Then you have to bypass. In the old days, IVF, IVF was first known, the first uh, sort of uh, phrase for IVF was tube bypass technology. But very soon after, we used it for so many different indications, endometriosis, severe male factor, uh, blocked tubes, uh, genetic disorders. We use a lot of IVF. Now a big growth area in IVF is genetic disorders. I have couples coming to me, unfortunately, with a child with a genetic disorder. Mm -hmm. We make the embryo. We look at the genes that this embryo has. And those embryos that don't have the gene, we put back. Those who have the gene, we put aside. So that's a big growth area as well. Mm. So coming to the question, what's the difference? The difference is what uh, we do in a big IVF lab uh, of getting the sperm and eggs together and growing it day by day. The early baby is called a blastocyst and it reaches day five, five days of age. That's when nature puts it back into the womb. We create that in a lab, but... God creates that in a fallopian tube. Imagine that's the fallopian tube is just not a tube. It's a very intricate, uh, very special organ in the body that brings the sperms and eggs together, grows the sperm and eggs, uh, and makes an embryo right up to day five, and then drops it into the womb. And uh, hopefully, God willing, a baby grows within the womb. See, So the distinct difference, therefore, is in IVF, we extricate or extract the eggs mm. and we make a few more so that it makes it efficient. And we take the sperms and in the laboratory, we merge the sperm and eggs together by a process called ICSI, which, is, which stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection or a simple terminology is inside the cell sperm injection and the embryologist takes every sperm checks it out very nicely, takes the best, best looking, handsome, most handsome sperm and puts it into the egg. And then 24 hours later, we see whether the mummy nucleus and the daddy nucleus are coming together, that's fertilization. Then the very next day, 24 hours later, that's the first time you can actually say that's a true individual. The merger between the mummy nucleus and the papa nucleus, it becomes one nucleus, the baby nucleus, and it splits into two. And that's called cleavage, cleaving uh, stage embryo. Then comes the third day, where you get a ball of cells. In the old days, we only knew how to make day two, day three embryos. So we had to put them back into the uterus. So even at that early stage, the human uterus is so resilient, it can nurture a day two, day three embryo. We know that. But ideally, to mimic nature, we would like to bring it to the stage that nature brings it in. Oh. So we grow it to day four, becomes a big ball of cells. Basically imagine a balloon of cells, a bowl of cells. And upon one area is a clump of cells. That's your baby cells. That's called the inner cell mass. Mm -hmm. Around it is what is destined to be a placenta where it sticks onto the womb. Mm -hmm. And that's called the trophectoderm. I know it's a mouthful of words. It's but a lot. There's a, a reason lot. why they're medical a doctors. Nice, <laughs> a nice embryo that grows, and this is what we look for. And if you have a nice blastocyst, your prospect of a pregnancy is high, mm. uh, especially if you are younger. You know, uh, so 
that's the that's what we do in the labs and we can freeze these embryos and it is this, uh, a major quantum uh, sort of uh, advancement it is because of the uh, great freezing technology that we have that we can put one embryo at a time and can freeze it because the survival of unfreezing the embryo is beyond 90%. Wow. Okay. So that's how we Amazing. have uh, significantly diminished all the problems we used to have all those years ago of tiny babies coming too soon and when they're premature. Mm. And that's why we are very averse to uh, putting two embryos or you, no way we put in more than three embryos in, uh, in, in this country. It's not allowed in any case, mm. uh, uh, blastocysts. And so putting... Two embryos, yes. It's nice to have twins, but it is fraught with a lot of problems. Mm. You know, babies coming out too soon. What if one baby is normal, one isn't? What if one baby comes out and miscarries and then it jeopardizes the other? And so on and so forth. So this is a discussion we have with our couples. It's not to say that we don't put both embryos in sometimes. In some instances, when things haven't worked out, we do do a uh, double embryo transfer and hopefully only one will uh, survive. In some instances, we have twins, but hopefully no more than that because on in certain occasions, very rarely, one of the other embryos might uh, split into two and we end up with yes. triplets. Yeah, so what I'm head. hearing is IUI is like everything's in the body yeah. and IVF really is natural, uh, almost, outside, yeah, right? Yeah. That's right, that's right. And if, let's say, a healthy 35-year-old were to walk in your doors, and what is the process of recommending? Should they go for IUI first or IVF? Or is it, what are the frame, okay, what's the framework so, around that? Hey, welcome yeah. to the Financial Coconut Podcast Network. I'm your host, Reggie, a.k.a. Your Chief Financial Coconut. And if you are loving what we are creating here, like, share, subscribe, share with your loved ones, comment in the comment section below. And yeah, we'll see you for great content on Chill Swift TFC. If a, a 35-year-old young girl comes to us, the first thing I'd ask is, where's your husband? <laughs> <laughs> Together with the partner, yeah. yes. <laughs> Problem. Uh, is this a second marriage? She's had problems before and so on and so forth. Or is, are there other medical conditions that she's suffering from as well? So getting a very thorough, uh, precise history is all important, not only for herself, but for her husband. Mm. Then diet issues, lifestyle issues. Are they smokers? Do they... Uh, uh, have they had a history of, for example, mumps, and that's affected uh, the husband um. when he was a child, and that's one of the uh, mm -hmm. really significant uh, ways in which one ha has much damage, uh, you know, with the sperm production and so on and so forth as well. So having had this history, then we talk about what is available to them. I would have had an opportunity to get, my nurses would have seen them, they have had their investigations done, and the investigations will comprise two segments really. One, why haven't I gotten pregnant? They would have had that, uh, been trying for some time now. And upon getting pregnant, am I going to be safe to carry the pregnancy? For example, I would have her go for a breast ultrasound, make sure she's otherwise healthy, the pregnancy is not going to be detrimental to her. These are some things that sometimes is uh, sort of glossed over. Mm -hmm. And one, when I'm pregnant, and this is by sheer uh, experience of many years of uh, looking after couples, what if I'm not vaccinated for my hepatitis A or B? What if I'm not vaccinated even for my chickenpox? Rubella, of course, all Singaporean girls are vaccinated, but a lot of our patients are foreigners and they're not vaccinated for that. The worst thing that can happen amongst all some of the other things that can happen is you painstakingly get pregnant and then lo and behold, you get a, a viral infection that affects mm -hmm. my baby. CMV, for example, toxoplasma, for example, these are medical terminologies, but these are organisms that can, in pregnancy, afflict the mom and not so much uh, causing a problem for the mom, but for the baby. So these are things that we try to look for. Nice. Yeah. I, I love how your question is so wholesome. Because my question is, okay, so every time the IVF doesn't work, right? Like first, like, how much? like yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so I, was, I was first going to ask, no, before, before you go to the finances, yes, yes, I was yes. curious, like data-wise, yeah. IUI versus IVF, right? 
which one is more clearly, successful? Like what is the uh, clearly, numbers around uh, it? Well, stress has got to do with not being pregnant as well. So if one wants to be fairly certain that you're going to get pregnant and given that, let's say I, I, I give you a scenario. I am 32 years old and uh, we have no apparent problem, unexplained. It's reasonable to do what's known as superovulation and IUI. Superovulation meaning, like I mentioned earlier, growing a few more eggs because you want to do something better than what nature has mm -hmm. done but has not produced results, and then IUI. There's a certain uh, threshold beyond which we don't keep on doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You reach what's known as the cumulative pregnancy rates. After three, maximum four, well-conducted uh, cycles, you would say, I think we've, we've uh, exhausted this. We should go on to IVF. Mm -hmm. However, things change. What if I'm 39 years old and you know that the egg quality and numbers decline as time goes on? Then we would tend to talk about IVF. And maybe the couple would say, Doc, can I try something more natural? Then I would say, okay, maybe one cycle. But, you know, what if I see there's something called the AMH levels. Mm -hmm. It is a... Uh, blood test that tells me the reservoir of my egg counts. Uh, and if it is exceedingly lowish, I would say, you know, you're better off going on to IVF mm -hmm. as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, all right to maybe try one cycle, but no more than that because, you know, time of, is of the essence and so on and so forth. So there's, yeah. a, there's a little bit of dialogue that must mm -hmm. occur. But some women and couples have come, they've done their research. Doc, I think I'm ready for my IVF. Mm -hmm. I know I need it. This is what I've gone through. Uh, this is what the tests have been do doing from elsewhere. I know what it takes. Uh, can I embark on my IVF? This is my lull period. This is this is counterproductive and it's causing a huge amount of distress. You know, in mid cycle, it's come to a a, a halt. So our government was one of the earliest governments, and I give kudos to them, mm. to reverse this decision way before uh, anywhere else in the world. You know, so they, they, I think they, it's also because Singapore has like very low low birth count. We need lah, mm. we need lah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> reproductive. Don't really get me out. started on that. That's, that's a whole that's new a whole thing. Other, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, why they, they, that's why they open up uh, IVF first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. but yeah. now I'm with you because I heard something around three to four cycles, yes. and I know approximately how much one cycle costs. Oh, yeah. So yes, please share with you're, us. You're talking about IVF cycles or IUI? I mean, I, I would love to hear both. Okay. You know, and in, also maybe in like a typical timeline for each cycle yeah. because a unit of cycle is very abstract for my head you know almost yeah, like one menstrual period a month okay. but it's not okay. a month of stimulation mm, mm. and Suen will be a witness to that <laughs> often if it is just tablets it's easier we usually start tablets from the third day of your menstrual cycle to the seventh day then we might do a scan uh, nine, on the ninth day and sometimes on the 11th day, and that's probably the the most that you need to do to see when your follicle is nice and ripe. The follicle is the egg bag, as you know. It's between 17 to 22 millimeters when we measure it in three dimensions. And if that's the case, we know physiologically that the egg within, we hope there's an egg, because it doesn't mean that every follicle has an egg, might be ripe so that we do what's known as a trigger so that we time exactly when the IUI uh, should be done. We help nature to hone in on that window of opportunity. And some couples, sometimes there's also an added stress. As a doctor, uh, having them go through this, you would, you might have to tell them, okay, maybe you try once here and once here and we do the IUI. And there's a tremendous amount of pressure, both for men and women, particularly in, in men, to performance anxiety and things like that, which we must help manage as well. And so we help them through this uh -huh. and we support the pregnancy really early in its mm. implantation phase by giving something called progesterone in the second half. Mm. So we go all out to try and make sure that this is... This happens, yeah, you know, and, yeah. but it's it's really biologically, it's the female that has to do a lot of the stuff. Mm, mm. And because of that, sometimes when a husband finds out he's got a low sperm count, he is consumed with guilt and he feels helpless. Honey, I'm so sorry you have to go through all of this, but 
I want to do more. Uh, you know, give me injections, doc. I, I, I will take the injections. Then I said, no, don't worry. Don't have to go for injection. But in ION, Tiffany is on this side and Cartier is on this side. So you're going to do your bed that way. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So, so but, that adds to the cost, like. Yeah, yeah exactly. Adds to the cost. <laughs> so yeah. some husbands yeah. want to help, but just I mean, biologically, there's only so much they can do. Yeah, and that yeah. is why sometimes they do poorly. And I'm not, um, you know, championing the male species as such. But what I'm saying is our hu- tremendous focus, both at the IVF center at the clinic, is all centered around the female. And the husband is somewhat left alone. Mm. So when he undergoes uh, uh, something psychological or things like that, he may not feel that he can easily gain, gain access. Uh, IUI, uh, the drugs and all, easily we are looking at the $4,000, $3,000 per cycle. range uh, per cycle. You see, that's okay. superovulation IUI when, mm. when we use injectable. We use tablets, it's a little less costly. But typically in Singapore, IVF, be it government or private, in the government sector, maybe 10 to 12, in the uh, private sector, 12 to even 20. Uh, because, yeah, so because, per cycle yeah. will be like 10 but, to 20,000, yeah, depending right. on where you go. And, okay. and in the government, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think everything is uh, in their website. Uh, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. The can, community can is here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fertility support. Yeah. Fertility support. Yeah. Fertility support. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. A tremendous, tremendous source of information. Mm-hmm. Uh, got everything there, you know, mm-hmm. and the personal experiences and all, but ballpark, uh, that's the cost we're, we're talking about. Wow. But there can be additional costs. For example, yeah. if the husband needs to extract the sperms from the testis, I know you would say, ouch, but uh, yeah, yeah, sounds, from the testis. Sounds, uh, sounds because they, they, they can't produce uh, the sperms through uh, ejaculate. That's another additional cost. I really cost. feel like asking how, um, how big is that needle? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's very tiny. It's very tiny. Yeah. It's yeah. very yeah. tiny. Okay, okay. Mm. It's like somebody punching. Thanks, thanks for helping, right? right. No, it's no, so motivational. Don't, don't scare right? them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... It's true. Yeah, no, it's, it's done under like anesthesia. Okay, uh, okay. There's something okay. called okay. through the skin extraction is mm. under local anesthetic. Mm. Then they go home right away soon after. And if it is uh, something where an incision is made, a small, small, tiny incision is made, the tissues are extracted for sperms, uh, they go home the same day too. Okay. You know? So yes, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's- Yeah, uncomfortable. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah I know. How it's much a very loaded, that <laughs> yeah, loaded yeah. How much uh, would that extra cost? Oh, that can be in the range. Uh, my urologist might uh, charge with hospitalization at least five to six thousand. Okay. Even okay. More. Yes. Okay. Wow. Easily. Wow. So Easily. it's it's quite pricey, lah. Mm. Essentially, right? So it's a very yeah. serious uh, but investment. I, I in must this uh, say that in the government hospitals, at mm. least uh, our government uh, has done a great job. Okay. So mm. I think we must recognize that uh, I'm not saying this with, because I'm going to get some brownie points but it's a fact no we'll work for you we'll work for you yeah. <laughs> I've been mistaken yeah, for yeah. Taman so, you know? yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> next election yeah. so I got to come in yeah, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> so they they have pretty much covered uh, a major segment of the courses, mm. including pre-implantation genetic testing as well mm-hmm. for genetic disorders. So in that regard, I think we are fortunate in this country in that regard. Mm. In the private sector, yes, it's a lot more costly, but you have a lot of leeway. You can come in at the time you want to come in. We can adjust schedule, schedules. Uh, and so on and so forth. You get personalized care. It's the doctor who does the scan, uh, your own doctor doing the scan, your own doctor talking to you, your own doctor doing the egg pickup, your own doctor doing the embryo transfer. You can have that level of care in the government sector, but you know you, you might want to engage a uh, specialist consult for, yeah. for that. That's also uh, there. Maybe maybe can give me a little bit more color around like the support. I mean, like we we did say, like there are all this like co-funding mm-hmm. and all that. Right? Mm. Like what would what would the numbers look like mm-hmm. at the end out of pocket? How much how much are people gonna for expect to pay? The public okay. sector. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, for 
some of the couples, right, they might not even come up with any cash. Mm. Really? Yeah, yes. in the first because, few cycles. Yes, yeah. because there's MediSafe also. Ah, okay, the, um, okay. The first, first round is 6,000. Second round, you can use 5,000. 5, 4, then 4,000. Hmm. Okay, so that would be MediSafe, out of the MediSafe, yes. like your own MediSafe. And then okay. there's co-funding as well. Okay, yes, 7,700. Yes, co-funding. Yeah. So essentially, sometimes some ladies don't even fork out with a yeah. So it's about $15,000 in total. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 7,700 co-payment from the government. Mm -hmm. And that is for every cycle. Co yes. co-funding for yes. every cycle. Yes. Every cycle. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So you can keep up doing to three no, cycles. Up to three, three, three okay. cycles. Okay, okay. okay. Yes. And uh, Just up to three. I mean Great. Uh, okay. younger than forty. If you started your program where before your age of forty, then you can yeah. uh, you but up to a maximum of two cycles. But the full range of cycles, uh if when you're younger. They, they support that because they know that after 40 it's uh, the success rates are poorer yes. so they want to discourage people from waiting far too waiting, long yeah. yeah okay okay so yeah. so this 7000 plus um co-payment mm -hmm. is before 40 Yes. And then after 40, no more. No, but if no, you if start you get it before started 40, before 40, it's okay. then you have it. You still ah, can yeah. use yeah, it after use 40. It, yeah. But if you, use, if you start after 40, then, then no. Uh, yeah. That's when oh, okay. you have the private sector okay, coming, okay. stepping so in. So the, the start means like I start the IVF mm. process. That means we mm. make First the embryo yeah, and everything yeah, and then we right. freeze it. You can actually right? start IUI also. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just start before 40. Okay. Yeah, what, what, any what fertility treatment. Just, mm. I mean, I'm very outside, uh, but just for, the, <laughs> just for the sake of like, you know, ignorant guys mm -hmm. out there, right? So what if we start the IVF process, uh, you know, like maybe 35, you know, you make the embryo. You said you could freeze it, right? Can I freeze for five years and then you can yes. freeze come it back in? for 27 years. The longer surviving blastocysts that yeah. became a wow. baby in wow. the United States was 27 years in, in the freezer. Wow. Yeah. So this couple had their own children, their children started having children and they didn't want to, you know, discard it. They donated it to another couple. Nice. You see, so, yeah. so in effect, actually is in suspended animation and that's why egg freezing has sprouted all over the world now because an egg can be frozen and it's got to do with the new technology, fairly new, it's been around for a while, called vitrification. Vitri is glass-like state in Greek. And what that means is we freeze it so rapidly to 196 degrees minus in nitrogen that it hasn't got time to crystallize, mm -hmm. you see? So crystallization is our big enemy. When you crystallize, the water molecules rupture and then our cells rupture, you see? So if we rapidly freeze, uh, it's, it's called vitrification. We can freeze our embryos. These days, we are freezing our embryos that way. We used to do what's known as slow freezing. Our success rate for survival after thawing was not as good. But now we have survival rates of in excess of 90. Some would even say 98%, mm -hmm. you see, for both eggs and embryos. And therein lies the most important thing about <coughs> IVF. IVF is the only technology that allows you to preserve your fertility literally infinitum. So if a young couple, as you pointed out, a 35-year-old comes in, I would urge them to do embryo, for want of a better word, embryo uh, banking. I, I tend to use the word mm -hmm. stockpiling, so, uh, so to speak, you know, um, because when you're young, if you have your embryos made, if you want to uh, sort of use your embryo years down the road, uh, you can. You don't have to go through the whole process again and it'll be less efficient. So if I started having uh, my IVF at age 35 and I've had my first baby and I want my second baby two years hence. I'm already 37, 38. And by the time you go through one pregnancy, easily two years pass you by, you know, the pregnancy, the breastfeeding, getting the courage to have another, the pitter patter of little feet again. It's two years down the road, three years down the road. But I have got 35-year-old embryos, you see? So my success rates be, would be of a 35-year-old. My Down syndrome rates would be that of a 35-year-old, not of a 38, 39 years old, year old, you see? So therein lies the tremendous, maybe I use the word power, of IVF. Mm -hmm. I can preserve my fertility because we as human, our fertility is so fragile. So let's say that 35-year-old couple walks in and they don't intend to have a kid like kids yet, mm -hmm. but they're doing that embryo banking and they want to fully utilize the government subsidies as well. Uh, that's not 
entirely allowed in Singapore mm. because you must have a legitimate reason for IVF. However, really great point you're bringing up because many couples in the United States, Australia, many parts of Europe, even in India, and not so much China, but I know for a fact in India, these are couples, they're coming in their early 30s. They feel that, okay, I want babies. And I think, dog, no, I make a better parent when I'm in my 40s. But I know the, the fragility of my fertility as well. So I want to uh, make my babies and keep them so that at a later date, I can have my babies without running the risk mm -hmm. of not having babies or miscarriages or abnormalities. But I caution them in, in this regard. This is just one segment of, uh, of your biology. The rest of you is aging. Mm -hmm. What if you have a growth in your uterus? What if you have God forbid, a cancer. What if you have other illnesses and so on and so forth? And we all know that the womb can go through changes. Uh, adenomyosis is when there's menstrual blood that is stuck inside that makes it not a receptive uh, sort of place for the babies to grow. So mm. majority of us will be all right. It's a good thing to do if you want to, but it costs money. And, and therefore, some people have said that's a treatment choice for the elite who can afford it because it's the biology. Mm. For men, in one way, you can reproduce through mm. the years, mm. but you do also go through genetic uh, derangements, uh, effects in the sperms as well. So men who are 50 and beyond, apparently, they have a high incidence of schizophrenia and other conditions in the child. It's not like they don't have any genetic uh, issues. And in this day and age now, with so many pollutants in our environment, cadmium, mercury, lead, all the microplastics, the sperm counts around the world have been crashing, not just plummeting, they've been crashing. Our great-grandfathers had a far higher sperm counts than any of us today. And so WHO has had to readjust their thresholds, you know. So we are facing a major epidemic of male infertility because of all the toxins that are in our water supply and, you know, even cosmetics. A lot of estrogens getting into the blood supply. I mean, not blood supply, the water supply. And it's affecting sperm counts tremendously. So much so that in some countries like China, I've known of a colleague where they have uh, kiosks where they freeze the sperms for men. Oh. Uh, just like women oh. are freezing their eggs. In fact, some men have come up to me and say, you can freeze eggs. What about us? Mm. Can we freeze sperms? Mm. Uh, I mean, theoretically, it's easier to do, can be done, less costly. But nevertheless, you know that this is a major thing that's going on. So the group of couples that we're seeing with male fertility problems is growing, ever growing, a huge problem. And it's been also suggested that even your phones, electromagnetic radiation can, if you put it in a pocket, can affect the sperm making cells in the testes as well. And the other thing, I, because I researched in this and I was asked to talk on this, was if you wanted to test the overall health of a city, all you need to do, the cell that is easy to uh, acquire access to is the sperms. And that is a barometer of the overall health wow. of that population, whether there's toxic substances wow. going on. Apparently. So where does Singapore rank in this? Uh, well, we are seeing quite a large number of male factor problems. We are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, our uh, it's TFR not, is quite low. <laughs> yes, our TFR is really yeah, low. It's very and, low. It's yeah, lower and, than average OECD. You see, in the schools, uh, young uh, boys and girls are taught how not to get pregnant. No one really teaches them what is, again, I will use the same word, the fragility of our fertility as well. Mm -hmm. If you even ask some of my doctor colleagues who are, mind you, gynecologists, and they are 40 years of age and say, oh, my wife is only 40 years old, no problem. I, I'm sure we've got plenty of time. To which I, I tell them the stark reality, no, you haven't. You know? So I don't know whether I, I really answered your question. So if a, when a 35-year-old couple comes in, the main person where age is uh, sort of sensitive is the female, then we would do some essential tests. The most essential, if you ask me to just concentrate on one test per person, is sperm counts for the husband 
AMH for the wife. Mm -hmm. AMH meaning egg reserve. So how much would that cost? So the <laughs> AMH is about $40. Okay, analysis is about that's 170 fine. That's fine. You know, that's fine. if you yeah, want to yeah. do it a bit more advanced, maybe $200, $300. Mm -hmm. But it's well worthwhile. Okay. There's been a big debate. Should we offer young women... Uh, instead of doing cholesterol and things like that, mm. if there were one test to check her fertility, should we use AMH? There's a big uh, controversy. Should we scare women? Just because I have an AMH of 8, am I any less fertile than someone with 15? There's so many other uh, multiple factors. To which I answer, it's... Uh, provide her that information mm. and do it uh, yeah. on a regular basis. If there's a downward trend, and we never know, I've got thirty-year-olds who come in with very poor egg counts, and she doesn't, she never knew. Yeah, uh, awareness, she, right? Yeah. It's key. Yes. So very I good. did four retrievals and nine transfers uh, to have my two beautiful daughters. So after going through so many rounds of IVF, I really feel that the success of IVF, right, it boils down to actually what conditions you have. So I personally feel that let's say if it's just a male issue, things might be simpler mm. than somebody just who put has... Just the needle in only, right? So, <laughs> no, because, because IVF right. can, choose, can choose the best, the most handsome looking sperm, right? Yes, Out yes. of the millions of sperm that you have, you can you can retrieve. I mean, you can ask the, hus the husband to, I mean, ejaculate I mean. a few times over a week to, to store the sperm so that you can get one sperm, right? But when it's woman, it's different. You lose one month means that whole lot of eggs is gone, you see. So if you... So I personally actually have autoimmune disorder. I have a blood condition that attacks my organs yeah and it actually causes miscarriages so i went through more than two miscarriages um during my nine transfers la. it sounds like there's quite a lot of money involved mm -hmm. there is quite a bit of like the emotional kind of challenges yes. that you have to go through like what kind of support did you have did you have counseling coaching like what insurance. kind of support insurance yeah, does, yes does it does it cover no. does insurance even cover these things no 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 okay, no. okay. No. insurance doesn't cover Unless yeah. I think you have some private insurance from private companies. Like rider on rider type of thing. No, right? so, um, oh no. like... Well, some German and French <laughs> yeah, yeah, companies. Yeah, like some international companies. Some, yes, right? I and think maybe Japanese, they do. And the Japanese patients of mine, the government, the government is very supportive. Uh, they have insurance coverage. Yeah, so, oh. But yeah. that's also limited. They have only a certain number of uh, mm. egg pickups and certain number of embryo transfers. But, um, but in Singapore, most of no. them, no. Okay. Unfortunately, no. Okay. no. Yeah. So even miscarriage in Singapore, if it's before 13 weeks, insurance also don't cover. How did you deal <sighs> with that then? Like, like what, what, in terms of financial? I mean, financial, no, I mean, more of the emotional, emotional side too, right? Yeah. Looking back, right, when I was going through the cycle, I only had one goal. My goal is I want a baby and I... And that is like my price, you see. So even when I failed, yes, I was very down. Mm. I actually didn't want to talk to any of my friends who have kids. I mean, we will talk, la, <sighs> like message. But then when they say, let's come for ba uh, my baby shower, I was like, oh, so sorry. I'm not free. I have work to do. I will, I will excuse myself. Of course, I'll still maybe give present or ang pao. But uh, I think that's how I safeguard my own emotions also. Fair. Because mm. imagine I can't have a baby Fair. and then I go to a baby shower or or mm. a kid's birthday, uh, I don't think I can deal with it. La. And yeah. I also don't want to bring my emotions to a birthday party, right? Yeah, so thankfully, my husband is very supportive. So he, uh, when we fail, he, he will always tell me, it's okay, Suet, let's do it again. Mm. I said, okay, let's do it again. And so, and my mom, um, she actually cooks for me very nutritious food so she'll like wonderful oh, mom yeah. yeah so she every time when I fail she was like okay never mind let's start again oh. so I'm, I'm hearing quite a bit of like strong boundaries yes. with yourself but also strong family strong family mm. support yes. a good husband so, and if there is one thing what do you wish you had known then I would say to be more logical to know that actually when you're doing IVF it's, it's for a chance it's not that you do IVF, you will definitely succeed. And also, every failure or any failure is not because of me. Mm -hmm. I'm not the cause of it. So I always, I always tell um, ladies, when they actually go through any failure, I actually say, no, you did your best. You did. 
Yeah, you went through all these treatments, you went through all the injections, all the anxiety. Actually, what we all want to know is we did our best. And what we all, all want the people around us to know also is we did put our best effort in and we, we really did our best already. And there's so many things outside of your yeah. control, mm. right? And yes. on that vein, um, the workplace environment is also all important. Yeah. In your in in their group, uh, there are some individuals I, I saw. Mm-hmm. I can't mention her by name, but she ex- uh, shared what she was going through at a workplace with her bosses and all. In fact, sometimes I've had to actually uh, speak to the boss on behalf of my patient and say that this is what she challenges mm-hmm. her. Uh, we need to uh, support, and the Singapore government and even Ministry of Manpower is very supportive of women and couples Mm. going through the fertility uh, journey and getting people at your workplace to understand it's getting there. I must say, uh, you know, things are changing quite rapidly. Uh, If I look at my practice the last five years and then 10 years ago, there have been tremendous strides. Nice. One being your group, and there have been mm. tremendous strides, you know. So, nice. and that's nice. also got to do with the fact that a lot more people are going through this. So it's not a, a sort of a taboo subject. Yeah. It's no longer like a myth that uh, you know IVF is only for those who are deferred or waited mm. so long. But you know, mm. young couples, as I pointed out, if mm. they have a male factor, she started when she was very young, and thankfully so because mm. then you know at least you had a greater opportunity for. Mm. Uh, Uh, eggs and younger eggs and so on and so forth. So the workplace environment Mm. plays a a huge Huge. role as well. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In closing, any last things you want to add? Any last things you want to shout out? I think you guys share a lot of good stuff. Uh, If you're going through fertility treatments or if your friends, family members are going through fertility treatments, come to fertilitysupport.sg on our IG. We do have a lot of uh, information inside. And also we do have meetups that we do face-to-face because I feel that face-to-face is really very important and it's a very private setting, in a private setting. So don't worry, all these are kept confidential. And we actually have 50 over WhatsApp groups like with all the different ladies in different like clinics and yeah different stages different different stage yes different Mm. stages and also different medical conditions so if you are actually facing all this some of the conditions something like virginismus Mm. it's very personal Uh, we do also have a whatsapp group for it you just contact us anytime there will be somebody who will answer you on on IG always there yes love it we are always there there's actually 20 20, 20 plus of us nice. volunteering. Mm. Yeah. Nice, so nice, nice. there's a lot of support in our group. Great, great. Love it. A lot of our dogs. So Where, how can uh, they reach you? The one message I want to put across yeah. is if you believe you might have a problem, even if you're not certain, don't wait. Mm. Please gain access to your doctor, um, a gynecologist, or even uh, need not be a specialist. Or just go into the website and re- read more about fertility. If you're younger than 35, if after maybe a year, 10 months of trying and nothing seems to be happening, please don't wait. Uh, gain access to anyone in the government hospital or the private sector to get more information whether you might have a problem or not. But if you're past 35, uh, within six months, you've not had a baby yet, then you might want to... Uh, you know, see your doctor about it and does, uh, do some important uh, tests in, to initiate uh, um, the process, you see. So time uh, and age, uh, particularly for, unfortunately, for, for the female, is all important. IVF doesn't work as well uh, the older we get. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's that's the thing um, that that I want to put across. Uh, you know, uh, although we realize it, we might not action on it. You know, so that's the message. Great, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thank you Thank for your time. You. Lovely. Thank you. That's awesome. Nice.